and welcome to all of you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, it's great to see your names and faces in our little virtual box here. Um, we are, we're happy that you're joining us. We're so glad that uh, Mining Watch is, uh, has agreed to do this. And just to give you a little look around, this is our group here. Uh, we thought we, we'd all get together in person so uh, we could share this, this time with you. Um, we, we decided that we would make this as Oh, John, I think you've been muted. Yeah, sorry. Um, I took my hand off the space bar. Um, we're vulnerable, vulnerable here in Nova Scotia to this new fr mining frenzy that's happening. And we realized, well, we, we have educated ourselves pretty well on the issues surrounding gold mining. We really didn't know very much at all about um, what we were facing in this rush to um, new mining for um, transition to more sustainable energy. And the, and the accompanying problems we might be facing. So we're so delighted that Jamie's going to give us a tutorial on that this evening. And uh, thanks so much. And I think it, with that, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, John. Um, and thank you to Sons and everybody for putting this together. I don't want to pretend that I've got a great presentation developed um, because I really wanted this to be more of an exchange and, and just, you know, have a really have a, a back and forth discussion to try and, and identify issues and, um, you know, try and, and fill in the gaps that way, because I, you know, that way that way we can talk about what we know and what we don't know and, uh, you know, really have, have more of a, more of a discussion and, and uh, less of a, less of a lecture. So, you know, I'll talk for a bit, and then and then I'll I'll talk some more when people have asked questions or when I think of things that I think I can contribute. So, uh, yeah, really great to see this bunch of folks, and uh, I'll start off by saying, you know, really I think for for many years I admired the work that the Tatamugu Center does, the work that Sons has done. Uh, you know, I think the the way that people come together and and the the results that they've been able to get are are just inspirational for some of us who've been in this and looking at different like different campaigns and and uh organizing efforts and and seeing the, the kind of commitment but also the you know the ingenuity and and the the kind of of cooperation that that uh that's really been evident and and i think a great example for other folks across the country and uh, and even across the continent, with you know, with people like John being involved through the Western Mining Action Network and tapping into some of the the uh, organizing in the United States and and so on, because a lot of these things are they're they're very local, but they're also very global, and and it's important to be able to keep both those aspects in sight. So, you know, I, I'm going to talk a little bit about just the the. Uh, the conundrum that we find ourselves in and and what's going on and and then you know focus in a little bit on um what what might be happening in nova scotia and uh, what might be dangerous about all of this you know so starting at the top uh, you know the 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 pressure for all of this is climate change and the push to decarbonize uh, to reach some kind of net zero CO two emissions sooner rather than later and all kinds of shenanigans around that in terms of what net zero means and whether net means anything at all if that you know if we're still uh, pumping oil out of ground and ripping tar sands and coal out of the ground and um, pretending that we can plant more trees than there is surface area of globe to suck up that carbon or some magic technology is going to fix it or um, we'll have nuclear power that will provide 
you know, energy that's too cheap to meter within our lifetimes. So all of that going on in the background, and unfortunately, a lot of it is actually attracting political attention and money. If you look at the latest federal budget, there's money in there for carbon capture and storage and for nuclear power plants that should be going to um, practical technologies that we know about, like public transit, that would reduce uh, emissions much more quickly and effectively. And, you know, and, and bypassing a lot of the really necessary structural changes that are going to be necessary and sooner would be better than later. You know, I, I think um, it's been commented that a lot of the kind of incremental changes that we're seeing now would have been great 30 years ago when a lot of these problems were first really being identified publicly. And now it's just too little too late. And the, you know, the worse it gets, the worse they, the, the more drastic the solutions need to be. So with all that said, you know, I, I think um, there's a there's a real focus on CO2 as a driver of, of climate change. And certainly, you know, burning fossil fuels drives climate change, but the extraction and processing of fossil fuels is also locally devastating. Uh, you know, we can we can look at Cape Breton, we can look at um, we can look at northern Alberta and see what happens with you know with coal or with tar sands extraction and the kind of effect that it has um not just environmentally but also socially and and in terms of the economic distortion that happens around it so i guess what i'm getting at is that the the focus on decarbonization really neglects the other aspects, the other dimensions of the poly crisis, as it's been called, that we find ourselves in, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of fresh water availability, in terms of, um, you know, seawater and, and uh, plastic pollution, in terms of inequality and migration and, and human misery. All of these things are just, are they're obviously interlinked and they're obviously getting worse. And um, and the problem really is that the, the, the intense focus on CO2 and decarbonization, what's been called the fetishization of carbon, can actually make this worse. So if that means that we're going to focus, you know, we, we in this case, I'm, I'm speaking we as the global north, as the, the people with more wealth than the rest of the planet, mostly because we took it from them, are going to continue taking wealth and continue over spending and over consuming, then we're going to make things worse in terms of, you know, as I indicated before, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of, of water availability, um, in terms of the, the direct environmental impacts, but also the, the indirect effects of poverty and exclusion. Um, you know, we're, we're going <laughs> to, we're going to make things worse, not better by electrifying our economy by continuing to expand our our overuse of resources except now focused on electricity and you know we'll see some of the, the crazy um moves that have been happening towards things like hydrogen which is remarkably inefficient and and just you know what we're, we're looking at a world where um bitcoin mining and and natural gas and, and hydrogen production are going to use up all of the available electricity and people are going to be stuck trying to figure out how to heat their homes. So, you know, and then, and as a making it worse for those who, who had less to begin with. Um, there's a bit of, of more sort of mining specific context that I want to provide in terms of, um, you know, the, the background of, of stopping fossil fuel extraction will also stop a lot of direct environmental and social damage, and it will create new social pressures. So we see, you know, um, with the oil patch uh, actually not being phased out yet, but being really worried about it. And, they, you know, so they tend on things like just transition for uh, oil workers and, and energy workers um into an economy that's much more precarious and unstable and won't provide you know good unionized jobs but will also not be as destructive to the environment all of this is um you know it's a mixed blessing 
obviously to to try and and stop a lot of that direct environmental destruction but we also need to look at at the impacts at the same time if we're going to have to expand renewable energy production and transmission and storage for homes for manufacturing and for transportation then the amount of material required to do that uh, is huge and that it means a lot of new mining. It means a lot of new mining waste being left on the countryside because the global trends are towards diminished ore grade, um, increased extraction and increased volumes of waste and increased conflict because of mining going into territories that, that are not mined, that are um, maybe valued for other things other than their mineral potential, you know, as as forests, as glaciers, as mountains, as people's livelihoods depend on them, and we're going to see more of that as well. So as as these trends continue, you know, those conflicts will continue, and the amount of waste being generated to produce the metals, lithium, the copper, um, the nickel that that are needed to to build the electric economy are just going to get increasingly out of hand and the the immediate footprint gets bigger but the long term liability increases many fold and and you know so what we're what we're leaving on the surface of the planet for subsequent generations to have to try and keep safe is uh, is just increasing exponentially and it's it's quite astounding and that's really the, you know, I think encapsulated in the, the, the contradictions around electric vehicles. So, you know, on the one hand, they're a great technology. Uh, they, they work really well um, and they, you know, they, they're, they're way more efficient than internal combustion engines. Um, obviously less polluting and, and a great, you know, a great technological advance. At the same time, they're cars. And we live in, you know, in North America, we live in a society that's, that's hugely over-dependent on cars and where um, not only are there more and more cars being produced and, uh, and bought all the time, but they're getting bigger and bigger. And they're, you know, so they're, they're consuming more and more material per person, per car. And there's no sign of those trends reversing yet. Obviously, they're, they're quite... Uh, quite sensitive. We've seen, you know, history has shown that people are really super adaptable. They just have to make up their minds. And so far, um, you know, so far the auto industry and governments have shown no sign of shifting from that course. And I, you know, so I keep calling it business as usual because it's electrified, but it's basically the exact same model of industrial manufacturing and globalized production and overconsumption that um, you know that's been in place for the last the last couple of generations really since World War II and you know it, it's it's just creating more and more of the same problems more highways means you know highways are being built over uh, class A farmland they're being through neighborhoods they're destroying social cohesion um, you know all the elements that that kind of ignored about cars like tires nobody's figured out what to do with the tires yet they're still talk there's you know thousands and thousands of them around and you know unless they periodically catch fire by themselves then then you know they're they're basically there for um centuries if not millennia and you know with very very limited possibilities for recycling and and uh, and reuse of those materials the last thing I want to touch on as far as that goes is the the aspect of of a circular economy or of of recycling and you know because there's there is obviously huge potential to do a lot more recycling than we do now um, the problem is that even really vastly improved recycling rates and and applications still won't meet the kinds of projections that we're seeing um, you know under this business as usual kind of model. So, you know, 
increasing consumption, increasing uh, auto production, auto auto population, if you will, means that that kind of focus just um, will leave us potentially orders of magnitude, in fact, away from fulfilling the the demand for material. So, you know, and and whether that can even ever be met by mining is a good question. You know, the 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 metals exist. <laughs> you know, they, the metals exist in the in the Earth's crust, but whether they can and should be extracted and processed is a whole different question and much more sensitive to uh, local geographies, to you know the, the the technical possibilities of extracting and separating and processing ore, but also you know how much habitat, how much fresh water, how much uh, you know intact landscape we actually need to leave for our our own survival. You know, and and whether that's uh, you know physical survival, economic survival, uh, the the, the so-called uh, ecosystem services of clean water and air, which are put in peril, but when you get too carried away with some of this uh, this activity, so all of that um, leaves us in a bit of a conundrum, you know, and and um, and I think it's increasingly clear that. There are broad changes needed, and some of these changes are underway, but at a, a much too uh, limited scale and pace to meet the meet the challenges and to prevent a lot of the disruption and conflict that is coming at us. So, you know, the, the challenge really is to restructure economy, restructure society for sustainability and resilience and that you know including things like accommodating climate refugees as the millions and millions of people displaced by unlivable literally unlivable situations in the global south uh move you know now they're they're currently moving up towards europe and um and the us and the you know this kind of, of dislocation and relocation is is just going to be even stronger in the future so you know can we can we develop the capacity to uh, make a place for people or are we just headed for a future of more conflict more border walls more enforcement more deportation and and more and more misery so that's that's not a very cheerful outlook and i want to <laughs> i want to turn it around and say that um you know at the same time all of the small changes that people are embarked on in their own lives and and working together um do add up and i and i think we're we're starting to see some of those some of those efforts really reaching a uh, critical mass where where things can start to shift quite quite rapidly um when the you know once once the conditions get there i'm going to turn back to um you know, the more local questions around you know what's what are the critical minerals what are what's what's happening in Nova Scotia um thank you John Baxter for putting up the the uh, Department of Natural Resources and Renewables draft list of critical minerals because they don't actually provide that anywhere that I could find um other than that presentation but there it is and so Nova Scotia has decided that uh there's the potential for Cobalt, copper, gallium, germanium, graphite, indium, lithium, manganese, niobium, rare earth elements, tantalum, tin, tungsten, and zinc all to be mined in Nova Scotia. Now, um, none of them are currently mined in Nova Scotia. So what does that mean? That means a whole crap load of exploration and clearly a government that is inclined to encourage and support mineral exploration. And that means more uh more drilling more road building more people uh poking around in the bush with uh instruments scientific instruments and um uh, and picks and drills and uh more disruption of uh you know wild places and in but also including people's backyards because of the the way that mining is is held um 
by provincial governments in this country as what they call the highest and best use of land. And um, it's it's not, <laughs> for starters, but also what that means is that aside from, you know, there, there, there may be specific exclusions of, um, you know, where parks already established, but or or specific activities already established that are out of bounds, but basically exploration can take place anywhere, and it it brings all this disruption with it. So, you know, there there really is of the the province successfully fomenting a real exploration boom. And I, I and you folks can tell me if you know where you see that happening now. The other thing is that as as this develops and you know we get to things like bulk sampling and and possibly in the space of uh let's say eight to ten to fifteen years actual mines operating um you know the 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 waste and the disruption from those operations themselves and i th just throw in that when when you're talking about things like rare earth elements and niobium Part of the reason that these things are less developed in North America is because they're very toxic, um, and they often are. In fact, no, in particular, is pretty much always associated with uranium. So you've got you then got toxic and radioactive waste to deal with. The other thread I want to call at. Um, is is more in and and I and I say that because it, there may be more potential here for something less nasty, which is um, getting involved in manufacturing and being able to attract um, manufacturing and recycling, for instance, processing and recycling to the province. And I'm sure the provincial government would be very happy to be able to do that. Um, you know, and the question really is where there are advantages to that that don't require huge subsidies to make them attractive. And I, I think, sadly, Nova Scotia is far too familiar with that dynamic um, of, you know, pouring millions of dollars into pulp mills that um, destroy the environment and poison people and um, continue to, to suck public money. For instance, so, you know, but that, again, I think that there, I don't want to scout the potential that that could still be, uh, you know, there there could be viable niches for that locally. And with that, I think, you know, obviously, um, no critical minerals are being mined at the moment. And, you know, at the at the rate that it takes to do the prospecting and develop the uh, develop the exploration activities to the point where we've got a solid resource to get the financing to uh, to go through the permitting, even if even if the permitting and environmental assessment processes are lame and streamlined, um, there's still a lot of engineering that needs to be done before you can build a mine at any level of safety, and that takes years. So. You know, like I say, eight years is, is probably the bare minimum, and we're more talking about uh, 10, 15, 20 years down the road before any of this is a, a physical reality. So I want to stop there and open the floor and ask people to jump in with comments and questions, and, and we can have a bit more of a, a back and forth here. So if there's any if any questions, feel free to chat uh, yep. type into the chat, um, or if you want to unmute um, and come yep. on. And um, there's a little button called Reactions at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and if you click on that, it has a raise hand button that will pop up and show us, and it'll put you at the top of the list so we can see you. Jamie, what I'm hearing, or I'm going to ask you if what if what I'm hearing is correct, is that basically the kind of mining that we're talking about 
is dreadfully impactful and the real and possible and, and really not really possible perhaps so that the real work that needs to be done is larger work than around mining it's around transforming our us from a car economy and so on um and mm -hmm. one of those other issues but it seems like we would still need to we would how would we do that in a way that resists mining too do you have any thoughts on that how well, we do that in a positive way well I, I think you know the naysayers yep um well, I think one of the things that actually ties those things together is land use planning, which is kind of a kind of a boring activity, maybe, but also <laughs> really, uh, you know, a, a really basic um, kind of construction of consensus around around the land, around the resources, and also uh, a really good defense against exploration. Well, so the you know the the stronger the stronger those kinds of processes can be, then then the greater the potential for, you know, on the one hand, defending territories against being overrun by exploration and, um, you know, and, and eventually possibly even mines, but also brings people together and, um, you know, allows all kinds of other discussions to happen around around priorities. What is it that we want to what is it that we want to do? What is it we want to have happen on this land? Well, I'm just going to say that's very interesting because the other prong that Suns is considering working on is land use planning in Colchester County because we're behind other counties and it has to be done. Mm -hmm. So far, it's a cookie cutter way, but we're going to push to have it a more genuine participatory process. So that's very interesting that you would say that as well. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, and, and I, as I say, you know, the the big thing about stopping mining if you don't want it to happen is you got to get in early. Yeah. You got to stop it before the uh, before really powerful interests get established. Um, Karen, you've got your hand up. And... Yes. Yeah, and thank you, Jamie, okay. for your thoughts from the global to the down to Nova Scotia scale, because they are things, topics that are turning in our minds in Nova Scotia and at multiple scales. And it's funny that you touch on land use planning, because it is an underpinning of a number of problems here is the lack of especially land use planning on crown land. Mm -hmm. So you see many projects, mines and others, proposed on Crown land because it's a free-for-all. The first person who asks about a lease on the land gets it. Um, right. So that is something that multiple groups could be pushing for and is something that the province is hearing more and more is we need Crown land planning um, and to get out in front, uh, like Crown land planning for where are the next batch of protected areas going to be, where exactly. are the most appropriate places for wind. You know, mining you can get in line, but there's some things we have to figure out first. The province isn't hearing that strongly enough right now. Um, I did want to say that I have heard that the province is working on a critical mineral strategy. Um, and, you know, we passed the Nova Scotia budget recently. And in the question period, the Minister of Natural Resources and Renewables said that that was going to come out in the next two to three months. So there is apparently a draft critical mineral strategy in the works and the public will see it in a draft form. Have you seen any critical mineral strategies from other parts of Canada that have some good elements? What are some, assuming this juggernaut is going ahead, what are some elements that we could call for in a critical mineral strategy? Huh. Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. A lot of it is a lot of it is terrible because it's just throwing money at, at um, exploration activities and development, mining development. Um, the the thing that there's a little bit of it in, in the federal strategy and not nearly enough but a little bit of uh money to support um planning processes actually and to support environmental assessment so that you know when there is a project you have um you have a public you've got communities who are prepared to engage with with those processes who you know have 
you know, have done their homework already because they've, they've been doing their um, working on their local planning efforts, but also learning about um, the, the way, you know, the environmental assessment process and so on. And importantly, you actually have government employees in, especially in the kind of science and technical side who are trained and experienced and know what they're doing. So there's, you know, that's, that's the potentially positive aspect. And uh, what, what we've been trying to promote is the idea that that, that is actually the best way of streamlining and speeding things up because you get to a yes or no much quicker if people don't have to start from scratch every time learning what the proposal is or what the dynamics are and try, trying to figure out, you know, okay, which side of the watershed is that on and um, all that kind of thing. And also when there are technical questions, they can actually be answered and they can be answered by, uh, you know, by government scientists, not by consultants that are paid for by the industry. And there's, there's other stuff as well. You know, I think, um in in sort of economic terms the canada canada has a very um i guess what you call a neoliberal approach to this which is basically what a friend of mine calls the the uh, spray and pray approach to uh policy making where you throw money at things and hope that something good comes out of it so they're you know they're throwing subsidies at industry and there aren't a lot of criteria attached to what happens and there's no, you know, there's no government commitment to investment. They're just, you know, it's free money. Um, you know, we did this, uh, with the, you know, with the economic crisis and, and again, with the, uh, again, with COVID basically just throwing money at industry and not claiming, you know, government's not claiming shares or any kind of commitments as a, as a return for putting in millions and billions of dollars which just seems crazy. I'm uh, gonna move on to Catherine or who's, who's that? it's Catherine on the screen. I don't know who's, yeah, John, you put the hand up. It's, it's John who put his hand up. Um, I just wanted to say we had a couple of, um, when we were starting to organize this, we, we put out a call for information um, to the WMAN list. And by this, I mean, the, our thinking about land use planning. And so we got some useful information back and, and references to uh, develop land use plans that I think uh, it was Karen who asked if there were um, uh, any, any helpful references. Uh, we can circulate those, but one right. of the, one of the things, interestingly, that came out of that was uh, <clears throat> a real roadblock to uh, effective land use planning and curtailing these kinds of activities is the free entry system in claims staking that preempt almost every other. <laughs> um, yep. And there, so, in fact, we we need to think about going one step further and addressing that issue in our province, which is um, uh, we've seen, I think the number is 40,000 claims. I can't remember, it was one of Joan, in one of Joan Baxter's articles um, that have already been staked here. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> once they're staked, the mining life cycle has begun. Yep. And in, It'd be one thing for us to get to be successful and have land use planning um, effectively implemented, but we also have to address the uh, the horrors of the free entry system and their impact on the environment and society and uh, the mining activities in the province. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I just maybe I'll mention briefly that. Um... Because I was in I was in Vancouver last week, and the hearings I was at are actually still going on. Um, in a court case where two First Nations, uh, Kikatla and Hattasat First Nation, are um, going after the the 
British Columbia government's Mineral Tenure Act, which has been essentially the same since 1859 and um, and the, the whole free entry system. So basically, you know, they're having mining problems on their territory. And like you said, John, they 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 put their finger on the problem and said the problem is that the mining claims are established and then mining can happen. And the mining claims can be established anywhere and they can be established by anybody. You know, in BC, it's like anybody with $25 and and, uh, and a computer can go online and start taking claims um, on anyone's territory without notification, much less consultation, much less consent. And the um, British Columbia government has a, a piece of legislation to implement the of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So they're, you know, they're sort of hanging on that saying, well, how can you, um, how can you have this commitment and even, you know, and even admit out loud in writing that the Mineral Tenure Act is not compliant with the, the UN Declaration, and yet it still goes on unhindered. So they've gone to court to to try and overturn that and, uh, Mining Watch was there along with a number of First Nations um, and the BC Human Rights Commission and so on to, <laughs> to try and, and support them. So it's, it's uh, and that's the first time, you know, we've, we've been fighting for 20 years to get that to happen. And, and finally, you know, um, these First Nations have, have been able to get it to court. That's not the, you know, taking 20 years and going to court isn't necessarily the best way to do things, but, um, it does reinforce the the idea that that's actually a really fundamental issue when it comes to all of this. I want to pick up actually on a little bit of the chat there about um, the the two Jones were talking about um, about tailings reprocessing and and that's another example of something that um, could be beneficial and could also be an absolute nightmare. So, you know, where you've got uh, mine tailings and wastes from old mine sites that are not safely being stored and you can reprocess them and you can extract valuable minerals from them and make them into a much safer uh, situation, that would be fantastic. Of course, the temptation is actually to do the opposite, to you know, strip strip the most valuable resources and and leave it, if anything, in worse shape than it was. So, um, and Ontario, um, as you might expect, is is taking the the latter approach. So, encouraging remining of old tailings and removing at the same time the uh, rehabilitation requirements. If nobody has questions, I'm going to have to tell a story. Although I, I will say, for those that those that don't know, I actually grew up in Pictou County. I don't know if you can tell. Yeah. I have a question, yeah. I'm question, Jamie. Familiar with the way things work. Uh, Karen has a Karen has a question again. Yeah. Mark does. Have yeah. I wonder how far to go down the royalty rabbit hole. So another thing that we mm -hmm. heard from the Nova Scotian government is that they're going to examine royalty rates. The royalty rate here for gold is like unbelievably low compared to say the rest of the world. Uh, also the royalty rate is still linked to that free entry system and the very colonial approach to land. So is, do you know of any places where they looked at royalty rates, they're getting a decent rate, the money that's coming in is going quite intentionally to, to good things, to things that partly compensate for the ruinous things that mining is doing. Like, could there be a good that comes out of demanding higher royalty rates for these things? I don't know about a good, but I think it certainly could be better. Um, and I don't, I don't think, like many of these things, I don't think I can point to one example that is that is great. But 
if you look at a number of different models in different places, there, you know, there are potential uh, pieces of a model that you could put together. So, you know, um, Peru actually has a system of of dividing royalties down to regional and municipal governments, so that you know the, there's a there's a benefit that goes to the national government for the whole country, um, and then it gets subdivided. Of course. They've got a lot of other problems that turn that into a liability, and I think one of the um, uh, one of the pieces of research I saw on that was was actually when they went to see where that money went at the municipal level, um, the municipal council didn't know where the money was. <laughs> <laughs> so somebody, the money had been paid to somebody and it disappeared. Mm -hmm. But they, you know, the idea was there. It didn't make it through the execution. And then if you look at just you know, royal rates overall, I think James Wilt did a piece a few years ago for the, I think it was for the Narwhal on on, um, on royalties and, and found that, you know, Ghana collects so close to 30% royalties on its gold. And it is a significant contributor to the national budget. You know, uh, we don't do that here. We, you know, assume that there's other benefits flowing which actually are not so the the flip side is that uh, none of this actually takes into consideration the the resource depletion um perversely enough resource depletion is something that mining companies can claim but governments can't and um you know so company can claim resource depletion against their taxes because they're using up the resource and yet the resource is actually public property it's you know the whole logic of it is that it belongs to the government um for the benefit of the people and uh, none of that is taken into consideration and in i think a lot of times if you look at the the broader environmental and social costs they can add up to more than the value of the resource itself by the time you've actually cleaned everything up and everything as good as you can afterwards um you know, never mind the small portion that the government actually took and redistributed and used to pay for public services. Jamie, uh, if I could just, this is Catherine here. If I yeah. could add to that, uh, it, Gold Corps was all too happy to have the pressure around royalties lit, raised up. They could give more and gave more to the municipality so that the devastation would be even greater because the, many in the municipality were shut up right. by, yep. by that. I, I, I think the royalty discussion is a very dangerous discussion yep. looking at environmental devastation. And as Joan Kuyak is pointing out in the chat, um, they can so find ways to weasel out of it, you know, find ways to redefine it so it doesn't Take much of a bite. Mark? Yeah, um, you're, you're from Sons. Uh, this is Mark Sander. I was very discouraged hearing a CBC this week. I don't know if anybody else heard it when they had the whole thing about mining and how Canada is going to get left behind and everybody is really like, you know, we, we got to do this and it's all critical. And, mm -hmm. and we have to have, I, I guess I know that we, it's terrible for the environment, but we have to have sacrifice zones. So where are those going to be? Yep. So I, I, I wanted to write something or call or whatever, but I, I felt so overwhelmed. Like, is it worth it even to talk to the back to CBC about how biased they are in the, the kind of story that was being um, spewed out that day? So I wanted to know if you have some way of talking about this kind of urgent emergency situation that's being pushed down our throats. Yeah, that was that was a pretty terrible piece, wasn't it? <laughs> I, mean, awesome. I mean, that show. I don't. I try to avoid that show too because it upsets me a lot. But because <laughs> they do that, they do that a lot. They, you know, and then um, sometimes they sometimes they really push people. And, and ask them tough questions, but it's always the wrong people. Yes. So, well, no, I, I, I mean one of the one of the things that that we've been trying to trying to reframe the whole discussion and say what's what's critical is clean water. 
you know what's 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 critical is is habitat it's not you know and what's what's critical is healthy communities it's not profit and when you get down to it um this is this whole industry is about making more profit it's not you know they're they're using this as an excuse and i think that's maybe the the thing to that we need to persuade the cbc is that they're being used as a pr vehicle by the industry because the industry you know and and government is you know right in bed with them is claiming this as a great social benefit that they're going to they're going to power the uh the energy transition and everything you know our all our all our climate problems will be solved because they can mine more and you know they we we need to be able to call that out as as propaganda as greenwashing it's not you know it's not real and and it's not going to work and i think from what i've seen i mean i've i've had some conversations with with folks at the cbc and and um some of them can grasp this and others can't uh, i think that's the nature of the beast but it's good to keep pushing them yeah joan baxter On mute. There. Okay, I'm unmuted. Um, Jamie, do you have any contact with Mitchell Beer from the Energy Mix at all? I do. Because he he took a I was surprised an op-ed from Ken Summers, who's gone to work for Everwind, <laughs> um, last week and 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 published it. And I was thinking, I haven't read any of any of the kinds of things you've said tonight in the Energy Mix, but I sure think there's room for it in there and he's got a good it's just a thought um we've we've had some long conversations i know he's 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 on several occasions recently dumped stuff that i've given him in into the energy mix without even being asked mm -hmm. what's the energy mix it's a it's a newsletter um on energy and climate that that um i don't know they have got a pretty good circulation they're really He's, they're really read by the government. They have yeah. they have really good reach with the federal government. And when I did the articles on it was when I did the articles on on hydrogen, it was actually commissioned by the energy mix first. Mm -hmm. And picked it up and then he got it into the Guardian. So I just I think it's a right really on. good. Yeah, anybody, yeah, yeah. Anybody, just my thoughts. Yeah. Yep. Thanks for that. Um, I'll, that's a that's a good motivator to to keep on him. I think he's also using it to train his people because he's he, he sent me several of his like junior junior reporters. He gets you know people that he's got working on stuff. <laughs> so he he sent he sent them to me to explain things to. Him. Which I don't mind at all. Yeah, uh, Val's posted the uh, one of those. I wonder if we come to the point of no. Is there some questions still? Um. Yeah. If there's an opening here, um, this is John at, at, with the Suns Group. Uh, question for you, Jamie. Have you had any contact with other communities uh, facing the similar situation that we're facing? And is there any, um, do you see any sort of networking emerging, networking possibilities or networking activities emerging um, in other in other provinces in Canada and other communities in the United States that um, might be helpful to us to make contact with. 
Yeah, um, I'd have to think about the U.S. I think there's there's a range of things going on there. Um, you know, I think some of the more high-profile ones are really have their own kind of dynamic. I'm thinking of the, the Thacker Pass lithium mine, which is now tragically actually being built. Um, but uh, the where things are really happening, and uh, I'm not in contact directly with folks because uh, this might call Rodrigue Turgeon, who works in Quebec, um, because they're going great in Quebec. <laughs> There's, you know, they've got. Uh, that incredible organizing and networking and media coverage and just you know public sort of presence in all of this. They're they're you know they're going after the mining claims and and the free entry system. They're um, they've got a a whole campaign around what they call declaiming the eskers because there's there's mining claims all over the the eskers across the. Um, the whole middle of the province and uh, or the, the southern middle of the province and um, you know as as wildlife habitat as uh, recreational areas as um, and really as fresh water sources you know, you know the esca bottled water have you ever seen that 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 comes from one of those eskers that's actually right next to a proposed mine as being you know being threatened by actual mining activity uh you know so it, it's a huge commercial interest as well as um an environmental one and you know but they've got they've got great campaigns and they've got great networking and um it's 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 all in french and so the rest of the country sort of doesn't even know what's happening yeah except for the you know maybe the francophones and other parts of you know, but... um th thanks for that that, that reminds so, me that Rodrigue has uh, um, offered to, to have a conversation um, with us through the W Man Canadian Caucus. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to have more contact with Nova Scotia. So yep. I'm hoping that all of us who are here on this, on this call um, would be interested in participating in a call with him. And aside from what Jamie has just said, one of the one of the things that we're working towards is that the next Western Mining Action Network conference is hopefully going to be in Quebec uh, in two a year from October. Mm -hmm. Like and a year so, and a half from now. Yeah. Yeah. And um, we're hoping that we'll be able to start make building those connections with what's going on in Quebec. That would be great. Um, all of that, and I think I think it would actually be a really good follow up to this to to, uh, to get Rodrigue to, to and and maybe one or two other people from some of those organizations uh, to talk about you know what they're what they're doing and and uh, what they've what what they're learning out of it all. Hmm. Yeah, good suggestion. Maybe Mark Fafard uh, yep. also would be. It. Would be Mark, Mark Fafard, uh, Mark Nantel. Um, there's a there, yeah. There's there's a few there's a few other key people, and um, but certainly, I mean, Rodrigue can can make that happen. He's super swamped right now, but um, you know, over the next maybe the next month or so, that should be possible. Well, if there are also no other questions now, I know we had sort of said we wanted to keep this to an hour and I know there's there's going to be lots of other discussion afterwards, um, but maybe this is a good, does it sound like a good space to wrap up for the evening? Um, if so, I'd just like to to really give a huge thanks to um, Sons for organizing this and Jamie for for talking. We'll um, we'll make sure to get this out uh, on up on um, online uh, in the next couple of days, um, if not tomorrow. Um, so if anyone wasn't able to make it to tonight's call, we can uh, make sure that they get this. Um, but thank you so much, everyone, and I'm sure we'll continue these conversations as they're now obviously I'd, very important. Now I'd just like to say thanks Catherine. to Jay Oh, sorry. Look into the green. Look. Okay, I'm looking. <laughs> I, think, I think I'm looking. Just thanks 
to, to Jamie and also to Val, but Jamie, I think it, it convinces me that we're going on the right track in, in trying to be ahead of the game here and, and really saying that this is not the way to go in Nova Scotia. And really thank you very much for giving us your time tonight to, uh, and to Mining Watch, really, yay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, sons. Thank you, flowing together. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Bye. Take care. Bye.